going on guys and welcome to another episode of Tales from the Underdog. Today I have a special guest, one of my good friends, a mentor, somebody that I met a couple years ago, Mr. Mike Arce. Thank you brother so much for inviting me to your house and uh, giving us the time to just be able to have a little bit of conversation of going a little bit back back of your um, beginning days of your entrepreneurship and even going a little bit back of just what inspired you to kind of like get into um, the businesses that you're at right now and uh, you know see what we're at, see what your underdog story is all about yeah well first thanks for having me on I seen you get all these really cool people on your podcast and I'm just watching patiently wait and I think Edwin's gonna ask me one day yeah well I was nervous I was nervous I've been nervous I'm like man when I asked Mike and when you finally asked me I said Okay, I qualified. I love qualify for underdogs. I love it. Um, so the journey began. Uh, well, I was in fitness for about a decade, and I got into fitness because I was in martial arts. I used to travel. I actually got. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I got two time Arizona State champ in martial arts here in Arizona. Oh, really? Yeah, and I traveled to Vegas for the Arizona State Games, and I was about nineteen at the time. When I turned twenty, like all these boys that I was fighting started becoming men. Like I just watched ten pounds of muscle being added on, and I wasn't adding any muscle, so. I was going to college for business. I decided to, I saw they had a major or not a major, a, uh, like a semester where it's an 18 credit semester. You can go for personal training. I figured well, I can't afford a trainer to teach me how to put this muscle on. I'll just learn how to be a trainer and I'll learn how to do it myself. And I fell in love with being the trainers. Then they had, they had me take on a client as part of the curriculum, took on my aunt. It was so cool. I stopped working at the restaurant I was working at while going to college and I started working at LA fitness. And then from there, I. 10 years in fitness, it just kind of went away from me. And then, and then I got real cocky. So I, I felt like the thing that was different between me and everybody else was I was really good at that sales and marketing piece. I felt like every other trainer was really good at like helping their members, but I was really good at the sales and marketing. So like I can do sales market for anybody. I started working with dentists, and doctors, and lawyers and all that. And uh, I wasn't, I, like I got stuck at about 42,000 in monthly recurring. I couldn't break that point for like two, three years. I'd get a client, I'd lose a client. And then uh, I read a book called Built to Sell. And I coincidentally, that same month or two, I had mentors tell me I should become a king of one instead of a, ma uh, a jack of all traits. Mm. And I chose fitness because that was my original passion for 10 years. And we went from 42K in multi recurring to 250K in multi recurring. Like nine months, 10 months, whatever it was, it was fast. And uh, we, we knew this is it. So we just kind of kept going from there and we just expanded. And how do we help gyms more, more than anybody else on the planet? And how old were you at this time? So this was 2016. I'm 41 now in 2024. So it's eight years ago. So I was 33. Nice. Yeah. So, but who was Mike Pryor as a child when you were young? Did you ever have any entrepreneurship? Were you, were you born with a silver spoon? Like how did, what did that all no, come about? No, my, I, I don't, I, so I was, here's a funny thing. I was just talking about this today. It's funny you ask. I grew up in a neighborhood that wasn't really like, tons of money. In fact, everybody, there's a lot of one car homes, like, you know, single, single car homes, um, or people, you know, kind of just barely making a paycheck to paycheck. And my dad was doing, I felt really good compared to everyone in the neighborhood. We had two cars, right? We had a Jeep Cher Cherokee and we had a van. Everybody else usually had a van. <laughs> we had, we had that. And, you know, just, you go to friend's house and you could just tell like, wow, it looks like, you know, we're doing pretty good. So I thought, we were rich, uh, you know, compared to what I saw up there. And then I moved down the shore the last two years and we moved in a neighborhood where our neighbors had Mercedes and Bentleys and all that, uh, not Bentleys, Mercedes and BMWs. And, uh, that's when I really realized like now we were the brokest ones in the block. I was the only one mowing the lawn. Everybody else had a guy and I was mowing the lawn. Yeah. And we were washing our own cars and we were doing that. So I got a kind of taste of both worlds, but uh, the only entrepreneur stuff I, I guess I had, and it was more of like just making money, which I guess is entrepreneurship in some way. Uh, I was, my dad made me shovel this up. And as I was shoveling, the guy across the street yells, hey, that's a joke. He goes, hey, you want to do my house next? Ha ha. And I go, no. And he goes, I'll pay you 10 bucks. And I go, yes. And so I, I did his house for 10 bucks. And then the guy next door goes, hey, you want to do my house next? And I was like, for how much? He's like 20 bucks. I'm like, yeah. So now I'm like, wow, people really pay for this. Yeah. So I started shoveling snow. And next thing you know, like I made sense of if I had more friends helping me, I can do this. So I actually got five friends and 
I got to the point where they would be the ones shoveling the snow. My job was to knock on the doors and get the next deal. And so we split half the profits and I was the sales guy just earning, you know, 20% or whatever it was. And, and how old are you at this time? 12. 12? Uh, whatever. How, I mean, it was young. I don't think I was into girls yet. So yeah. I had to be around there, you know, but, um, but yeah, it was fine. I mean, I didn't see it as a business to me. Yeah. It was like, we can just make some money. We can just go get more houses. We can finish a driveway in 20 minutes for all on it, as opposed to me for two hours. What'd your dad think what, what, about, for you doing all this stuff? It was great. Yeah? Yeah. And your mom? I don't remember. Oh. That was a long time ago. Okay. I think, I think with certain things like that, I, I think there's certain things you want to make your mom proud and there's certain yeah. things you want to make your dad proud. I think that was in my dad category. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. And do you think that's what sparked it up for you to want to get into sales and all that? And the starting I, point? I don't know if there was a spark to go, I need to be in sales. I think I just kind of found myself there. Um, I think my first, so my first sales job, remember I told you I, I decided I was going to be in fitness instead of restaurants yeah. once I got my personal training certification. So I went to get a job in LA Fitness as a trainer. So I'm like, let me do that during college. And um, they wouldn't bring me on as a trainer because I had to be certified in something that they needed as well. It's called NCCPT whatever that stands for. And so I said, okay, well, how long does that take? And the next test was coming up in a few months. But in the meantime, Mike, if you want, you can be as an assistant manager, which really just meant you're going to sell training to new members that joined. So I started selling it. I, I did a pretty good job. And so that that's, I think that's the first real sales job in this industry. But prior to that, um, at 19, I did door to door sales. Actually, that, that was probably when I realized I was pretty good. I did door-to-door -door sales in the hood because I was the only one that spoke Spanish. Where were you living at? Here. Oh, really? I moved here on my 18th birthday in Arizona. I was in Jersey for the first 18 years. 18th birthday, I moved out here. 19th birthday, I saw an ad for a job that you can make really good money. And I went there and it was a door-to-door -door sales selling alarm systems. And I got paid $50 more per sale because I was bilingual. They also sent me the, to the hood. And so, yeah, a guy that takes everybody in a van, drops people off in different corners. You go out there knocking. Then eventually four months in, I was the guy in the van. That's a team leader. And it was kind of like a pimp in a weird way. Yeah. And like you basically go get everybody in a van. You drop them off on corners, make me money. <laughs> and then you come back. And then if anyone gets in trouble, you have to go to them and help. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, I actually did the exact same thing for the Daily News. Do you know, uh, I don't know if you remember, but like LA Times. News, yeah. yeah. So like you would go out there and get subscriptions and stuff like that. And I remember we were maybe like 16 years old or something and we would get dropped off and everything and i remember telling my friend i was like man this is like this is hard you know what i mean yeah. and then i remember they would give us a commission i don't remember what it was but i'll simplify it like say we would sign somebody up and they would give us 20 bucks for every whatever 100 bucks whatever it was but they would pay the commission higher up front because i guess they were the long-term game for them they were playing yeah. so i remember telling my friend like hey listen like because his dad had passed away, he got in a life insurance, he had a lot of money, and we say, hey, let's borrow, let me borrow five grand, you put five grand, and we just give it away, and if we invest 5,000, we would get like a tremendous amount of our return. I don't remember what the number, but it was a crazy amount. So we ended up being top sales guys yeah. at like 16 years old, and we just, 16? yeah, door to door, door, -to -door but we were buying the subscription, we were giving it for free. Yeah, yeah. So we would knock on your door and we would give it to you for free. So we would be like, hey, you know, Mike, just want to let you know right now we're giving a full year. Would you like? Everybody was like, yeah. What happened was we started running out of names. So we started put, making names up. And I think somebody made like a kid's name up. Yeah. And what they did was they started following up and saying, hey, Mike, how are you? You know, wanted to see how everything was. Mike, my son's six years old. Like, why? Yeah. And that's why we got caught. But they were taking us out to restaurants. They were giving us bonuses. They were wondering how we did it until we got caught. But it was good money. It was a couple grand a week, you know? I will say I didn't get that clever. We were just, I, I got great at Spanish. I, so Spanish was my own. I didn't know English until I was five. So what that meant was I spoke like a five-year-old. My vocabulary never got deeper than that. They found out in Spanish. They sent me to the hood. And I realized I didn't know how to talk about alarm systems in Spanish because I never used that kind of stuff at five. So my Spanish got really, really good over that year. And I remember working so hard here in Arizona where it's 120 degrees outside in the summer. I remember working my ass off to be able to get in the van and not on the street before like May. And I got there right at May. And then this way I was able to stay in the air conditioning. Jeez. How long did you do that for? Almost a year. Think about it. Really? Yeah. Door to door sales is one of the hardest things. Yeah. That was one of the hardest things because you get, I mean, and I don't know what it's like in non-hoods. 
but I got goons pulled on me. I had dogs chase me. I had a dog bite me. Uh, you know, you have people threaten you. Uh, yeah, it's it's right. You have people invite you in the house just to mess with you. Yeah, yeah. I remember I, clearly, like it was yesterday. Somebody yelled at uh, the guy that I was working with. He yelled at us so bad. And he was my buddy. He was 16. I, he made him cry. And I was like, why are you crying? He was like, that guy was an asshole, man. Uh, we were kids. We never knew what rejection was, you know. But we had that where people would slam or be rude or whatever. But this one particular guy just let us have it, you know. But and So after that, what what, uh, what else inspired you to to continue to go? I know you did the whole, uh, the gyms and all that. How long did you do that for with uh, the chips? Yeah. Well, I'm still doing it now. Um, you know, this has been the most exciting journey I've ever been on. Cause I'm good at it. Okay. And I think people tend to like what they're good at and I feel really good at it and I enjoy it. Uh, I think the coolest thing is when you can get to do what you want to do. I've loved fitness. I even told my wife, I was like, I, one day what I told her is before we niched to fitness and we were doing, you know, marketing for employers and anybody that tapes money. I said, one day I want to get back in the fitness industry and miss it. I love it. And, but I also love sales and marketing and I made money here more money than I did here. So to be able to combine the two. Yeah. Like this is, this is my, this is perfect. Yeah. And then Mike, so in your journey of, uh, you know, creating the company that you have right now and all that, how I remember you telling us like there was nights where you, did you have bad, you know, like adversity, bad times where you just had to sleep in the office or anything like that? Like what were your troubling times? Like, that's what I want to know. The, the, the bad times, the Jews, like, because everybody sees who you are now, what you've created, and what you've even been helped us in, in thousands of other gyms. But where was the hard time? Where were the times where, like, it was the struggle? The Did you ever have any of those almost yeah. going out of yeah, business? The first, the, first, the first six years, I didn't make any money. The first six years, um, definitely the first four, because I remember my, Gianna was about to be born when we really got this thing launched. And then it was when Ollie, was four years apart, was born. We started to feel a little bit of air. But the first six years, we weren't really making money, but we were eating. Yes, Marjan, I know you know Marjan well now. We were eating peanut butter jelly, the cheapest peanut butter, the cheapest jelly, the cheapest bread. We were eating mac and cheese and tuna, which is delicious, by the way, with peas. And then um, salad with canned chicken. And that was every day. So salad mix and canned chicken. That was our, that, we lived on that, ramen. We lived on that. And our kids did too, which kind of sucked, right? Like yeah. back now, and I mean, you feel good, you fed them, but at the same time, you're like, man, like they weren't eating the best food. They were eating some pretty like, I, then again, in retrospect, there's some countries, right? So I'm still blessed. Right. But yeah, I mean, that was, that was tough. We had, I watched my car get repoed twice during that time frame. My house, if it was, if the economy wasn't so bad, my house would have got taken away. But because the economy was so bad and everybody was like losing their house, I guess the, the banks were giving people a, a few more warnings than they normally would like today. So I went nine months without paying my mortgage and didn't get kicked out. So I should have got kicked out quite a few times. This is COVID time? No, this is 2009, 10. So this is when the recession hit. Yeah. Yeah, very. And, you know, we'd see family take vacations. They take their annual thing. If my sister and my dad and my brother, they would all go. They'd be like, come on, you got to come. And I would... I would tell them oh, I can because I got to work, but I couldn't because I couldn't afford it. And I because I had to work. I had both. You miss out on things, barbecues, all that. You say, I can't, I got to work. And the worst part is you have to lie. You don't have to, but I think it's just your instinct because you, you want to be positive. You want to be optimistic. When people are like, hey, how's everything going? It looks like it's going great because you're posting online. So right. you, even though you're dying on the inside and it's not working online, you're like posting your company's wins and you're posting the new hires that you have and the new things that you're doing. So, of course, like your aunts, your cousins, everyone's like, man, you look like you're doing so great. How are you? Man, this guy, this guy. And meanwhile, deep down, you're like, my car is in some parking lot yeah. <laughs> and locked up and I can't get it. I'm going to get my house taken away any second. So, but you say, yeah, things are good. Things are good. And I think you, I believed it because in my brain, I, I, I don't think, I think you have to think that way or else you crumble. Yeah. But do you feel in those moments... Did you think like I could get out of this or did you feel, man, like maybe this is, I'm not cut out for this or I need to look for a job or I need to like, what were going out in those times? Because there's a lot of people that went out of business and never recovered from it. I quit three times. Three times I quit. All three times Marjan convinced me to go back. Really? 
And when you quit, why, why were the tipping points of those quitting? Or like, what was it that? The first time I quit, I remember I had worked so hard. I was working weekends. I was working nights on weekends. Uh, I was missing things that the kids were doing. I was missing first steps, like sh all the stuff you don't want to miss. And I, I was able to listen to the wall of the conference room to where the employees are. And I heard them talk about how I'm not like running this business right. How like they're basically criticizing me and like they need to pay, I need to pay them more. Uh, and the funny thing is every one of them was making more than me. I was making no money. Yeah. I was borrowing money to pay their paychecks. And I just heard the criticism as if I was doing it as if I was rich and as if I was like doing it to like, just be a jerk. And I remember I was giving everything I had, like they had everything I had. And so I, I didn't, I didn't even tell them I heard, it. I just walked out the other way. And so we're in the hallway. She was walking up as I was walking out and I just said, I'm done. She's like, wow. I was like, I, I, the, I can't take this. I'm doing, I'm giving these guys everything I've got. They've got every penny I have and every penny I don't have. And they're, they're talking about me like I'm this asshole and I can't do this anymore. And then she walked with me in the hallway. She listened to me rant for like probably a minute or two. And then I don't remember what she said. I just remember how I felt and I felt like I could take it. So I just went back in there and did it. And that was the first time. I that was the hardest one. Damn. I love that. I, I think those are the stories that a lot of people don't really understand or hear or get to hear. And I think like I was, I've said it to everybody that's, I've had the privilege to sit down with. It's like, everybody has an underdog moment or where they get kicked down or, you know, it's, it's, I can't tell you how many I've had, but it's like, people don't understand. They just, like you said, they just see what you have now and everything you've gone through in those moments where you wanted to quit and you continue to go. And like, you look back, like you said, like feeding your kids and you know what I mean? And, and the whole tuna and things like that. And it's like, that's that's just your history that's who you are that's what you you know what i mean you've been able to create and what you stand on as a foundation you know and and for me as well it's like that's what i look for that's what keeps me going every single day because you're right we post every day and even till now like yeah we do great but there's moments where just like anybody we have adversity shit shifts people leave us whatever it might be people quit on us and we have to pivot and sometimes we take an impact even when we are doing good you know and it's like it just gives you something to look forward to, to say, you know what, if they went through it, if they did it, I can do it. You know what yeah. I mean? And I think, um, and I applaud you for that because, you know, everybody, I mean, myself, I've been, since the day I met you, I've been just so impressed of just how kind and how giving you are and how intelligent you are. But I knew there was a story behind, which I didn't know all this. I knew that you had some troubling times, but I didn't know how deep and what oh, you had. Plenty, man. But people think that it's just, especially right now in social media, the way everything is pushed out so quick that they get frustrated of like, why don't I have it? You know what I mean? I've been doing this for two years, three years. Well, you know, and I had, I had somebody that I had dinner with. And by the way, I've learned now, thankfully, to never be too committed to a way of thinking because I've watched myself change my mind several times about a certain truth. And, um, you know, I think, I think when it like profound, there's, so what's the opposite of a profound statement, a non-profound statement, right? Something that's not profound. What's the, what's the opposite of a profound truth? A different profound truth, right? So for example, consistency is good, right? Being consistent. But you could also say variety is good. So those are two different opposing ideas. They're both true. Um, so that's, that's actually, there's a thing called, for, called co uh, cognitive dissonance. It's the ability to hold two truths that are opposing, but at the same time. Um, but the person I was having dinner with was talking to me about uh, too many people post your highlight reels. That's it. It's post your, people got to be posting their bad times too, not just their positive times. I remember seeing that angle and I went home thinking like, you know what? I'm going to post some of that too. And I had such a hard time thinking of what I was going to say. And then I realized that the reason I'm posting only the good stuff is not because I want people to think that everything's perfect in my life. It's because I don't want to think about the bad stuff. I'm past it. It's like Kobe misses a shot. He's not going to post about it. And it's not because he's, he's ashamed that he missed a shot. And he doesn't want people to think that he misses. It's that in his mind, he's got to focus on making shots. 
he's got to focus on his wins. He's got to focus, like in his brain, Michael Jordan's one of his, my favorite quotes of Michael Jordan is, uh, practice like you've never won, play like you've never lost. Okay. So in practice, yeah, when, when no one's looking, I'm thinking about like my fuck ups and I'm thinking about the things that I could have done better. But when I'm in the game, no, like I'm practicing. I want you guys to see me at my best. Now, in a conversation like this, when you're asking for it, I'm not, sure, I'm not afraid to tell you. But if I'm just going to share, I want to, I want to spread positivity. And I get there's some, and like I said, I'm not committed to the idea. Maybe a year from now, you watch me post some sad stuff. Yeah. But right now, I like the idea of keeping the most positive things, being optimistic, and focusing on what I have to do versus, you know, sharing and editing. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I never thought about it like that, and it, it, I even have a hard time like really talking about my real, real bad times because for me, it's like. Whatever I did yesterday, whatever happened, who gives a shit? Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep winning. Yeah. Until somebody brings it up or taps into it. And because that's, that's, that's pretty deep, you know, and especially having a great woman on your side to keep you going and pushing you and encouraging and all that is just phenomenal because I think sometimes when you're by yourself, at least for myself, for a long time, I had not only was I by myself, but I have a, I had a partner that didn't really like support me and kind of kick me down when I was down. But even that made me great. You know what I mean? Even those moments made me like, yeah. look at where I'm at now. Look at what I've created because of those moments, you know? And, and I just thrive yeah, from because it. Because of, in spite of. Or in spite of, yeah. You know, because you could have done that regardless. Would you have? It's a different question. That's but, true. But, um, you know, the cool thing is when you get, when you're able to do something, even though this happened, like you just made it harder for you, you still did it. Yeah. How do you feel now when you have adversity and, and challenges? How do you take it up now as opposed to before? Like, what's changed? Well, I think, I think your de definition of adversity is different. So, you know, if you've never been through adversity, your ice cream falls on the floor. This is like the worst day of your life. But if you've had really bad times, ice cream falling on the floor is, is not a problem, right? Um, I, the last few weeks, with the exception of today, today was a great day. Today was a fantastic day. I, I had a blast today. Such really good things happened. Everything just seemed like it was aligning. The perfect day almost. Pretty much perfect. The weeks before this, the two weeks prior, was very, very difficult. A lot of big changes in the company. A lot of adversity as far as like uh, people feeling overwhelmed and having to wear different hats, having to learn, relearn things that we kind of let like, go of a little bit. There was just a lot going on, but it never felt like insurmountable because I had the frame of COVID. It's nowhere near as hard as COVID. COVID was hard. I'm the fitness industry. We had, you know, tons of gyms we're working with throughout the world. So it's not even like COVID was a worldwide thing. It's not like, oh, it just sucks in Arizona. Oh, it just sucks in the U.S., Oh, it just sucks in North America. No, my clients in Australia, my clients in New Zealand, my clients in Singapore, my clients anywhere were shutting down. So that was hard. And, and it wasn't hard because I was like, what am I going to do? I didn't even think about me. I knew I was going to be fine. You give me, you give me a, a piece of the floor. I know me and my family, we've, we've thought about life and what's important, what's not important. If I lost everything here, I wouldn't care. You know, I feel totally fine rebuilding, figuring it out. What I felt bad for was all the gyms we worked with that haven't gotten there yet. And the ones that were worried about losing everything they worked for, as if you can't get it back. All the ones that thought about how their life was going to change, what people were going to think of them, what their kids were going to do. I wasn't worried for me. I was worried for them because I knew, I, at least I believed in my brain, what I told myself is if I can't help some of them might get so bad that they take their own lives. They might change their whole trajectory, how they raise their kids. Like a lot can change if we don't keep them right. So I felt responsible for that. So I never got, it's like when somebody's like, somebody close to them dies and they, and somebody in the family's taking it really, really bad. They don't get a chance to grieve because they're helping this person grieve. You know. I never got a chance. I never had a chance. By the time I was settled in, COVID was over. It's funny because not funny, but that's that's exactly how I was thinking with the gym and just the businesses. Just because of everything, I was just like, we lose everything. It's, it's pretty simple to redo it, but 
understanding like and just seeing people going out of, out of business and people that I knew and people that just couldn't handle they have never gone through something like that I, I went through the 2008 that's when I started my business 2005 so 2008 was is it horrible you know what I mean from I've, I've never gone through a recession I don't even think there's aside from COVID that there were both two different types of recessions but like for me when when COVID hit it was even though it was like a worldwide and affected everything, it was just, I handled it differently than everybody else. You know what I mean? Would you feel, would you say that 2008 was worse than the COVID or? I can't remember. Yeah? You just buried it and put it in the back? No, no, I just can't. I mean, they would have to be side by side. Got it, got it. I, I, I don't remember if what was worse, what was not worse. I'll tell you though, neither will, you want a little work, the worst feeling I ever had? It was on something that didn't even happen, which makes everything easier. So everybody out there that's like, man, what if I didn't have it first? What do I do? Like real literacy. Yeah, you can. You can still feel it. And I think about death a lot, probably every day. Not just my death, but the death of everyone around me that I know and love. Now, that sounds morbid, but in reality, there is no way to reach a sense of gratitude higher and faster than realizing that that person is actually still alive, and huggable, and kissable. I don't know if you've ever done this. I know a lot of people have. You ever think about something that didn't even happen, that could happen, and, and you're driving and you actually start crying on that drive? You ever get there? Yeah, Kim, Kim did. You yeah. never got there. Yeah, I do. That, you felt that, didn't you? Yeah. You feel that. I've cried. I've done it. I've made myself get there. There's nothing that ever really happened that was as bad as that. Nothing. I thought about my kids. I thought about my wife. I thought about my mom, my dad, me, and then having to watch my kids deal with that. Like all those things in my head. I thought about my funeral, the way people are talking about me, how sad they are that I died so young. Uh, what's a couple weeks at work that are tougher going to do? All that shit didn't happen. That was the worst that could happen. I've already imagined the worst. Why do you think you you go to that space? And do you think it's do you think it balances work as far as like the troubles that you go through work and all that and really make just makes you realize like I think hey it's to to the day you're born you have a hundred percent chance of death you will die and everyone you know will die so to be unprepared for that sleep is scary when you when i see people that have someone close and die and they're like they can't believe it and it's like you could tell it's the first time they really ever thought about that it's even worse when that happens and it's a person they haven't talked to in years out of spite or whatever my grandfather died after 20 years i remember I was, uh, uh, well i was close to my grandfather oh uh, he was the last one that really like only spoke italian in our family but didn't look speak any i'm at his funeral and while I'm at his, or his way, while I'm there, I'm standing there next to my dad. And I, this is the only real wake I've been to. So that was like, where was Italian? So I don't know how they all are, but all the men stand by the casket. All the women sit in the front row. And as I'm standing there, this is back 2021, while wearing masks. And I'm looking at my grandfather in the casket. And I look to the right and I watch my grandfather, same guy, walk in the door. And I'm like, I'm tripping right now. I'm crying already. I'm tripping. I go to my dad. I go, dad, is that not him walking through the door right now? And he looks over. He goes, oh my God, Kane. I go, what? He goes, that's his brother. I forgot he had a brother. He hasn't talked to him in 20 years. 20 years later, this guy shows up crying. You haven't thought about this day in 20 years. You forgot that this could happen. He must have because he never thought about it. Because if he thought about it, he'd have been here earlier. So hard to hold a grudge when you realize it means nothing at the end. Yeah. yeah. No, so I, 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 think, I think the easiest way to be grateful for anything you've got is imagine it gone. Is that something that you feel that like right now? Because you, how how, you say you do it daily, right? You think about it daily? Throughout the day. But how do you? Is that something that you're in like, okay, I'm, way. I'm not crying all the time. Right, right. In the best way. You know, like when I look at my daughter walk in the door, I look at her and I go like, dang, she's here today. Or sometimes it's not even about her being gone. It's about her still being little. Like, man, she's little. And I look at her 
as if this is a memory I'm wanting to pull back 20 years from now. Like I'm wanting to see and feel this now. Cause I can't remember my son at four. Like I can't like really remember it. I have to watch a video. So I look at her as if I'm looking at a memory, even though it's like real time. Like I imagine she's like 40 years old, 50 years old on real life. But like here I am, it's got flashed back into this moment. Now, all I know is right now my son's 17. I'd give everything I have to have him back at four. Every dollar I have, every penny I'd have, I'd give it if I can have him back at four. Now, imagine I have my daughter at seven right now. One day she'll be 30. The way I look at her right now, the way I look at all my kids right now, I keep, I'm like real emotional with them lately. Like I just hug them whole, longer, all that stuff. Cause you just, and even your wife, you got Kim, like how young she is right now. One day she'll be seven. No. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, you're going to, you're going to, you look at her different knowing that like, wow, this is a young kid. I would be dead by then, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, you know, what's funny. <laughs> you know, what's funny, Mike, is that Kim catches me when my kids, cause I have a uh, joint custody of my kids. And then sometimes I'll have a breakdown and she's like, what's going on? And I was like, I just like, you never get those moments back. You know what I mean? And it's like, I emotionally just be like, man. And like, that's why like, for me, like, like you said, like hug them and all that, because I'm like, I have them 50% of the time. So that means half of the year I don't see them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, and I still got to work and run the businesses and everything. And I think I made a video yesterday because we went to Universal Studios and I said, you know, it's not about being in the room. It's about being present in the moment, you know, because what good is it if I'm on the couch and he's there and there's no interaction. And, and sometimes I catch myself in that because I'm like, he leaves Monday. You're not going to see him until the next Monday. And like, you never know what could happen. You got to make those moments count because it's not so much about the for me, for the death part, is like he's never gonna be ten again because he turns eleven on next Tuesday. He's never gonna be ten again, ever. No, you know. And, and you got a couple good years. My son, he's at work right now. He worked last night. He worked the night before. He works tomorrow day, and tomorrow night he's going out with his friends. Now I've made it mandatory that he's got to make time for his family at least on Sundays. But I don't want him to stop working because I want him to appreciate work and that stuff too. So I've got to let it go. But. We work out together when we can in the morning. And then on Sundays, like you have to have a date for family. You, you, and I told him, I go that cause he, he did it a, li a little while back where I was like, you're working seven days. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, but then with that, with school, what do you hang out with us? He's like, I don't know. And I go, that's not the way we do things. Family will be here forever. Work will change. There will be no other dad like me for you. And one day I'll be gone. And you're going to go, did I have to work that shift that week? And we talked about it. So yeah, he's now, he, Sundays are ours. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. How has your son, um, uh, how has been your influence uh, with him as far as like how he's seen you grow in business and all that? And yeah. taking a, That's the worst part about being a parent is you don't know if he did a good job until they're like 30. Has he taken any <laughs> interest though in like what you do and as far as like reading books and all the stuff that you like? Sometimes he's in and out. I mean, it's hard because you're competing with everything else he hangs around. So you're hoping to teach him more that he's being untaught. And, and as, as they get older and they start being more independent, they start hanging out. So you got to hope that who they hang out with has raised, has been raised by people that have those same beliefs. But especially at 17, you just kind of become, I mean, it should become a product of your environment. Right. You know that. So yeah, that's why that's the other reason why we want to spend that time and be close and Honestly, lately, it feels like every conversation there's some level of worry. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've got it. I know, look, no matter what, there's influence that I've got on my kids. There's stuff, if you would have asked me at 17, 18, or if you asked my dad when I was 17, 18, he probably would have said, I don't think he's worried anything for me. But that lesson of your family, I learned that from my dad. We were on our way home. We drove two hours away from a family, uh, like our cousin's house two hours away and a car breaks down it was back in 1999 and I was a kid and she was like, oh man, what are we going to do? We're so far. And we were two hours from where we needed to go and two hours from where we were, it's four hour drive. So we walked like a mile to a payphone. We got to a payphone and we called who we left our cousin to see if they called a tow truck. They're like, we're coming. And they literally drove two cars one to be able to get us and the other one to be able to get our luggage and all that because we were about to move to Arizona. And my dad, I remember on the way home, he was talking to me and it was just me and him. 
everybody was sleeping in the back and he goes, you see, that's why you stay close to family. They're the only ones that will do something like this for you. And uh, that stuck forever. I've told my son that. That's amazing. So you, you have influence. You just don't know yeah. it until later. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's one thing that I probably like, I don't, I don't want to say that I kick myself or just make sure that I'm uh, trying my best is really, you know, what is, because, you know, business is great and everything, but at the, over, uh, at the end of the day, you don't take none of that with you. You want to improve your life and, and just everything that you're doing for yourself to leave it to your children or give them a better life. And sometimes I'm like, is it worth it? it, it you know, where are my priorities at? Because I didn't, I didn't grow up, you know what I mean, with a great, you know, family, and we weren't very close. And even till now, like, we, I haven't seen my siblings in for a long time, and there's a lot going on, and my parents divorced, and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, but I, but I, I remember watching TV as I grew up. I remember the when I used to be married. I remember the first Thanksgiving that I had was having a dinner with like where you didn't eat until like there was like everything was put out and i remember just seeing that in movies and i used to be like man this is white people shit you know what i mean where like you cut the turkey and stuff like that because i never did that it was always like yeah it's christmas and somebody eating there and like there was never a family time and i remember just being like oh i want this like i, I love this you know what i mean yeah. um because i just came from a broken home you know what i mean and so to me like when i took on business and everything i i gave it and i continue to give it my all but now as I'm getting older and my kids are getting older, I'm just like, it, I'm in a weird space right now where I'm like, yes, I like this, but I don't, I don't want to regret this yeah. with my kids. You know what I mean? You can't give everything your all. It sounds good. Yeah. It sounds good in theory. And I think everybody knows what that really means, but they don't ever think about it. You can't give everything your all. You got to give stuff to your health. Otherwise, you can't give the other thing your all. You got to give stuff to people because we're, we're, we're a, a we're civilization, like humans are pack animals. We need other people. So we have to give other people stuff because if we don't give other people stuff, we can't receive stuff, which means we're not going to be our best at work either. You have to give stuff to your mind, these kind of conversations. Otherwise, you can't. So you can't give anything your all yeah. because humans are complex creatures. So we need a lot of things and any one thing will, will kill us. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good balance. It's hard. Uh, and I think I think it, it depends on what is needed at that time. Right now, my son needs me more than I think he's ever needed me. So I've I've been putting more time into my son. I would say this year than probably the last two years combined. Really? Yeah. What do you think it is? Is it has he is he asking you for it or do you see it? He doesn't know. He's seventeen. You know, oh, seventeen. Damn. You think you know, and and the worst is you you're believing you know, and. I've been asking people that have had kids that are 17. I've asked my dad, man, I've, t I've actually been leaning on my dad now, uh, uncles, calling people that have, everybody I talk to that's got kids that are 17, 18, I'm asking them. And the good thing is, it sounds like most people I talk to, 16 and 17 is like the hardest age, they say. Yeah, that's the hardest one. So uh, that just tells me, okay, well, if that's the hardest age, that just means that I need to be my best. You know, so I'm engaged. Does he still want to spend time with that? Like as far as, because I know you guys did Six Flag and all that. Was it hard for him to go with you or was he with open to us? Yeah. Yeah, we had a blast. I mean, like we, I've always been engaged. Like, I was this basketball coach for 20, 30 seasons, you know, because we, we did three seasons a year and sometimes two seasons to one season, right? Two weeks. So I was his coach. I mean, I always spend a lot of time with him. I'm at everything he does. I don't miss a game. I don't miss a birthday. So, but I just think, He's 17. Dude, yeah. when I was 17, I just wanted to be out. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. And Mike, so I want to talk a, lot, a little bit about Loud Rumor okay. and how that was created and everything. I think, uh, I mean, obviously you've helped us a lot. And But what was the mission on that when you created? I know that you were in the health fitness industry and all that, but like what made you really want to take on helping other gyms to grow and really putting yourself out there to just really share that knowledge that you knew in the fitness industry and be able to help companies like ours, like MTK and thousands of other gyms. In the beginning, when I first met, yeah, money. I was broke. I was tired of being broke. And I read a book that said, you should get good at one thing, like pick, pick a niche. I talked to mentors said, pick a niche. Niches are in the rich, or riches are in the niches. And so I was just six years of being broke, man. And I was working 18 hours a day on weekends. And so was my wife. So I did it because I needed something different. I was going away for paid. And then I started making money, 
once I was able to start making money and I was able to breathe, then I was able to like start kind of finding some joy a little bit more. But in the beginning, truthfully, it wasn't out of a passion. Like, oh, I'm going to do fitness now. I was like, I see. Sure, I'll do anything. Yeah. You say niche file, isn't it? Niche images are niche. It's like, uh, but then, you know, you start getting close to clients and you start hearing what you've done for them and you start like understanding that you're good at something. And so you want to be better at it. You want to get more. And so really the, the passion self evolved from just like watching it, like it work. So going back to, um, to the louder and why you did it and, you know, money at, in the beginning and all that, um, you were saying that, um, first you were just passionate just to make money because you were broke. It wasn't passion to make money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, desperate. <laughs> I needed money because I owed people money. Okay. Um, and I had credit cards and that they were maxed out. Like, I mean, I just needed to make money. And then, but at what point was the turning point where you're like, wait, I actually right passionate. Away. Oh my God, dude. Once I niched to fitness, I forgot how good I was when I was in it. There was a reason why I was good at it for 10 years or so when I was in the industry. I was great. I, there was a reason I got cocky and started something helping everybody because I was so good at fitness. So, I mean, within a couple months, I mean, you got to remember, it took me six years to get to 42 clients before I not been niched to fitness. Hey. Inside of like six to eight months, I had like 200 some clients in just working with gyms. So I was good at it. Felt good. Jeez. Went fast. Yeah. And then, okay, so you so you started Loud Rumor, right? You wanted to do it because you needed money. You were in debt. You wanted to pay some stuff off. Then you fell in love with it. What was the next step after that? Where were you at? Well, now it's now you got you got stories that you want. You're addicted to getting more. You hear somebody say, you changed my life. Or you hear a gym owner that say, like, I never thought about stuff this way. Or I never heard of a KPI. Like, little yeah. things like that, right? But you're... You're just like, wow. And so now you're addicted. Now you're like, you, you start recognizing other challenges and you start thinking of different ways to solve them. Because the mission is a sick, right? The, the mission is to help shape the side of the business industry. I think this fitness industry is a, is a mess right now. You got some gyms that are like the studio manager is doing the sales. Uh, the front desk is doing the sales. Some don't have front desk. Some have salespeople. Some don't have salespeople. Some have the coaches doing the sales. It's, it's all over the place. That's not how industries scale successfully. If you think about like restaurants, right? Your favorite restaurant, whatever it is, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but I can tell you how it goes. When you walk in, there's a host stand, isn't there? And she asks you if you have a reservation. If you say, yeah, you put your name. If they say no, they tell you a wait time. Then when you get sat, the host seats you. And then somebody comes over and takes your drink order, tells you somebody else is going to come by. They give you your drinks and they tell you the special, right? Like all the way to the end where they make a joke and go, just see you move to there? Like all the way to the end and the black check that's safe. The only two things that separate one restaurant from another is the product, food, and the atmosphere. You go to a different type of restaurant, Chipotle or Subway or Pan Pan uh, Panda Express, right? They're all the same. You line up, do the thing. The only thing that's different is the product, the food, and the atmosphere. McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell is your own style. And that same thing when you go to Macy's or Nordstrom or any of those, right? Like you... And the reason is because you don't want the customers to think about what do I do now? When you go into Macy's, you know what to do. You know, generally, okay, this is where the men's stuff is. So everything should just be around here. Okay. This is the jewelry area. This is where everything, everything should be. When you go to the restaurant, you know, okay, I'm going to open a menu and now I'm looking, I know appetizers are going to be here. I know desserts are going to be at the end. I know there's a separate drink list. Why does everyone do the same? Why do you want to copy everyone? No, because you don't want the customers to think about the process. You want the customers to enjoy the product and the atmosphere. That's what they're buying. But in the gym space, it's all over the place. Every gym's doing their own thing. Yeah. We're thinking too much. What do I do here? Do I talk to you? Do I talk to you? Okay, so are you going to be my trainer? So what do I do? I fill out this? Is it a waiver? But like all over the place. And so the process needs to be invisible. That a product and the atmosphere that should be the only thing that people were really looking at when you do that now things that matter are being exposed so we've got to start hiding the process to the customer and that's because it's so seamless and consistent and the customer already knows what to do the customer is trained you walk into a room you know where the light switch is 
I mean, if a homeowner wanted to be a home builder wanted to be different, he put the light switch somewhere else, right? right. Like mine or different. I put my you don't want the light switch is an important thing. Nobody's going, you see where they put the light switches at base? Yeah. No, no one says that. They talk about the kitchen, the counters, the, those things that matter. This is a process. You see what I'm saying? It's just fire. So <laughs> no, it makes sense. So what we care about doing is how do we create how do we really shape the business side of this industry? So that the things that matter the most, the customers can enjoy, and the things that don't are invisible. And we're far from that still. We got a long way to go, but we're making progress. And you know, because you've seen a lot of the gyms we work with, yeah. a lot of them it's starting to happen. It's starting to become like there's parallels now, and that's where they start growing. You, you've done a great job. Why do you think though that the gym? Do you think there's a lot of industries that are? struggling with that format as far as successful companies and why do you think gyms because gyms have been around for a long time is it just the boutiques yeah no it's, it's, it's a new industry boutiques are new got it you know gyms have been around for a long time so that's why you know right you go to a gym a big box gym you know as soon as you walk in what's going to be right there no reception big front desk yeah. right with the reception right and you know what to do how do you how do you check in they okay, scan it scan your thing and then you go left or right right you know where the locker rooms are generally going to be and then you know that the machines are going to be where the machines are. The free weights are going to be where the free weights are. The cables are going to be where the cables are. And you know there's going to be a circuit. Right or man, You right. know where the plates are. You know exactly how to find. It's the same. What I care about judging this gym is the atmosphere and the product. What kind of stuff do you have here? Planet Fitness has different stuff than like a big like competitor type gym, right? They got the crazy machines you've never seen before. Planet Fitness is the easy stuff. Yeah. What do you think makes a... What determines a successful gym and, and when they're starting off, right? As opposed to one successful to the other. Do you think it's just the way that people are, are taking action and the things that you're teaching them? Um, well, I think it's first to say, why are you unsuccessful? Okay. Because the reason one might be unsuccessful might be different than another. So usually if you're not successful, it comes down to one of two things. Uh, I mean... There's a lot of little things within it, but these are the two main things. Either A, you, you set really good priorities that if, if you do these things, we'll get to where we want to go. And then you just didn't do it. That's one. Number two, you did everything you said you were going to do, but you worked on the wrong stuff. That's it. Like you shouldn't have done those things. You're, why, why are you wasting time doing this? A lot of what we do with Major gyms we work with is getting them to stop doing a lot of this. Like, why are you doing Motivation Mondays? Like, you're spending how much time every week posting Motivation Mondays and, you know, Max Out Mondays and something Saturday and something Thursday. And you just keep doing it because it's a thing that you keep doing. Or you've got sales, or you got your people that could be salespeople, you know, doing stuff around, uh, I don't know what they're doing on their CRM, but in reality, like, let's make some calls. Your, your people, your front desk staff should be generating 10 leads a week, minimum. They should be making 50 to 80 calls a day, minimum. We should be generating three referrals per sale. If we're not doing these things, if we're doing other things instead with our time, stop doing those things. So I think a lot of it's like, what's, what's hurting us first? Let's, what's already the constraint? Let's get that out of the way. And then we can say, now we can start adding things. Damn, I, and I think I think that's what actually when we joined you guys, that's where we were at. We were doing a little bit of unnecessary things that we needed to clean up, but we knew that we needed guidance, and we knew there was something wrong. We didn't know what, so we needed an outside. And I think that's why when we found you guys, it really even in the beginning, we went to the first event. Um, we wanted to change everything, which was also an approach that I think I don't recommend. I think it was just now when we go and whether it's a power call or it's in a GSD event or it's a, or it's a sit down with like with me and you, it's like, okay, what are the one and two, one or two things that we need to change and we need to go in, hone in on that and really go back and really see whether it's a KPI, see the changes that's done for us. And that's honestly what's changed our company a tremendous amount. Because looking back, we've cut off a lot of the fluff and the fat, which was unnecessary and such a waste of time. hundred percent. And I think the thing that we've gotten really good at as an organization, I think anybody in the fitness industry or anybody that's in the coaching business or anything like that, I mean, if you're in any business, because you get your people as well, you're in some level of leadership role. The one thing I learned, I had a mentor, you met him, Dave Burke, where you at the... Yeah. 
And one thing he taught me was there's a difference between a master and an expert. And a lot of people want to be experts and, but you don't want to work with an expert. You want to work with a master and there's a difference. So Michael Jordan, would you say he's an expert or a master? Uh, my master, you would say he's a master, yeah. right? Cause master sounds like the best of all best, but in the definition in which Dave broke down to me, an expert says, here's what I did. So when you see people posting online, uh, four gyms, buy gyms. Oh, I built this many gyms. You could do what I did. So uh, an expert is someone that says, here's what I did. Go do it. A master says, here's what you should do. So Michael Jordan was the owner of a team. He went to practice. He helped coach teams on cats, the wizard. He was never able to make any team successful. Never. He was never able to make any player successful except for one. Do you know which player he really, really helped? Kobe. Kobe. Guess what though? He can say to him, this is what I did. Do it. You know why? They're both six foot six. They're both shooting guards. They both have the same playing style. So what worked for me will exactly work for you because you're the same. Just follow. But every other player is vastly different than Kobe and Jordan. You know, so he can't say, this is what I did. Go do it. Now, you take people like Customano, Mike Tyson's trainer. You take people like Greg Popovich, the Spurs coach, Bill Belichick. These guys. Custom model never reached the level Tyson was at, right? right. Very few people did. The model was getting close. Greg, Greg Popovich, arguably the best coach in NBA history, never played a game in the NBA. Bill Belichick never even played a game of football in college. Never mind the pros. He played lacrosse in high school. What's Tiger Woods' coach name? His dad. His dad never played at Tiger Woods. Some people are really good at being players. Some people are really good at getting players to be better than they've ever been. And what we're really good at is not saying, go do it. Because that might fail for you. Not everyone is a size nine shoe. So just because you are, doesn't mean everyone should squeeze their foot in the air. What we say is, hey, based on you, right? We did that today in the kitchen. You asked about this thing I'm doing in my gym. And then would you say, how would I do it in mine? Damn. And did I teach you how to do it? Yeah. It's different than what I would do, right? Yeah. An expert couldn't do that. Now, it's arrogant to call myself a master. And everybody watching goes, wow, this guy's really fucking humbled. I worked hard to be one. I'm not an expert. And I'm not a master at a lot of things. I suck at 99.9% .9 of things, but I worked really, really hard to be able to believe that I am one now at this. Because I know, because I've seen it happen. So uh, I'm sorry that it looks like I might have a little bit of an ego. But I think anybody that's built anything great has one. I don't know anyone that's ever built anything great that did not have an ego. You just don't let your ego make bad decisions. You use your ego to help you do good things. You know, it's it's funny that you, and I think it was you who gave me the spanking. And I know Kim will remember. Um, it was the second GSD. I don't think we were we were members yet. We went there, and then I was, and I remember being so like intrigued by your speech and everything that you knew and your knowledge, and I don't remember i think it was you that i asked or i asked i remember at least talked to my team and i said how many gyms i, I try to figure out how many gyms you own or if you own any gyms right and you didn't end up owning any and i was and then there was a moment i had that conversation and i was like well, how are we going to listen to this guy who has no gyms and this and that and I, i'm pretty sure was it with you that i had the conversation there was coming some it was a, it was very similar to this and it, about the whole master it wasn't those exact words but it was the same thing it was and then i sat there and i was like oh shit it was about the coaches, people who never played, like the Tiger Woods and everything. And I was like, never again. And I knew that was ego talking, like, how am I going to listen to this guy if he's never? And look at where we're at. Look how much we grew. Look at the seven figures that we, that, the records that we broke, like the, the influence that we were even able to have of our growth to be able to help other people in the same industry, in the same, you know, in the same loud rumor, you know, community and everything because, um, we just listened to what you said and the knowledge that you and your team had and we executed and we and we went gun home and we were and at, from day, that day on honestly i learned a valuable lesson that it's it, it's the difference between a master and what you're saying and and some yeah. people are really good at being great and some people are really good at making others great and i'm okay with knowing i'm not the best player in the world but i'm really good at helping people be great and you can't name one player that's considered the greatest that ever made a great coach. And you can't consider one coach that was considered the greatest that ever made a great player. They're two different people. Yeah. Two totally different people. It's different skill sets. 
do you think you can see somebody and be like is that person's a master or a or a great um i don't know dude. I don't know. I never, I never want to assess it that quick. Maybe. Do you look for certain people that are masters as opposed to, oh, how does that, how do you determine who's going to mentor you? Like and all my, that? my mentor, Dave Burt, who I, I reference a lot, he's a master. Cause, cause he's told me stuff like, no, that's what I did. That's how you should do. I've heard him say that to me where he goes, well, no, no, just cause I did it. You shouldn't do that. You should be focusing more on this. That he says a lot. That's your unique kick. He says it a lot. Unique capability. I've heard him say unique capability to a bunch of people. That's your unique capability. So if Custom Auto started training Floyd Mayweather, he wouldn't teach him to fight Mike Tyson. Two totally different fighters. Two different unique capabilities. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I mean, I would tell you in my life, speaking with you, having dinner, having one-on-ones, having conversations, having calls, you definitely have changed my mind of how I look at things as a... As, a master, I mean, somebody who really knows the industry and ins and outs. And it's never been like, hey, this is what I did, like you said. This is what you should do for your industry. Just the way we asked you in the kitchen earlier. And it's like really made us pivot and change the way we do things. And, you know, it's... Uh, Instead of saying, what did you do? Say, what have you helped other people do? If you're looking for a coach. Yeah. Now, if you're looking for a person to be an employee on your team or a partner, what did you do? But if you're looking for somebody to coach you, guide you, what have you helped others do? Mm. That's different, right? Because one says, if you're a great coach, the other one's if you're a great player. I, if I'm looking for a coach, I don't care what you built. I want to know the people you've helped build. I want to know that. Who worked with him? Who is this guy's coach? So actually, that, that'd be better. If a guy comes up to me and he says, hey, man, I built this, I built this, I built this. If you want, I can show you. I'll be like, who's your coach? Cause I'd rather work for that guy. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I don't want to work with the guy that did it. How do you determine like the people that you, that you bring on board? The, like, as far as like, I guess, who do you put them? Cause you have other leaders that you build in your company as far as what they're looking for. And have you had also, have you had people that you're like, I can't work with these people? Well, that's new culture. And I, I do believe that I have to be able to enjoy having a conversation with you. Like I want to be able to have, to, and, and that does, I don't think that's true for everybody. I, I'm not saying that's what everybody needs to be like. And that's, again, an example of like, it's not, that's for me. I'm a, I'm a very much a connection type person. So if I can't connect with you, I have a hard time coaching you or developing you or, or anything like that. But there's other people I know that they don't need to have that connection. They're just really good at saying like, these are the things that have to be done and I need you to do it. And this is what, what it needs to be done by. So I think for that type of a person, you really just need to look, make sure they fit the overall company culture so that they don't ruin what you've worked on building as far as the vibe of the people and that they have the skill to get it done. For me, I kind of want to feel that you can feel the things I feel. Like if, if you can't think deep, I don't know if I want you on the team. You're too shallow to get a lot of the things we're going to want to work on. You're too shallow to like understand why certain things are being done. When I say we're looking to shape the business side of the industry, that's too big for you to follow. Yeah, you're like, oh, well, that's a big ass thing. How are you going to do that? Right. But somebody that could think deep is like, damn, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah, you're right. Fitness is a mess compared to restaurants. Restaurants are all the same. So like, but some people watching right now might be like, that sounds stupid. I'm like, I follow. That's okay. You might not be the right fit for my company. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people might be listening or watching and they're going like, damn, I would love to be on board with something like that for my company. You might be a great fit for my company. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. And that's one thing that we've taken from you guys about the whole culture and everything and just really finding individuals that want to run with us because we want to sell the dream. I think when we met you, we said we wanted to go nationwide. And then like, we went through adversity and we're like, you know, we just were like, man, this is harder than what we thought, you know? But then we started talking to other individuals who had five gyms, six gyms, four gyms, and then you really start realizing what it really takes. And it's not that it's, a, it's hard 100. It, and from what I've learned, it's hard like that fourth to fifth gym. And then after that, it normally starts to scale quicker. And, you know, we were just thinking like, oh, we want 100 gyms nationwide. And when you think like that, you're just like, oh, shit. But then when you really realize that the hard part is that one to five, and you start talking to individuals of what they've gone through and you start going through it, you really start to really see like it's possible. And I think that's kind of what we're at right now in that second gym where we're just not too sure. And we're just like, man, this is, it's a, it's a lot of work. Well, you're assessing so, and that's okay. So that's, 
here's another example of cognitive dissonance, right? Two opposing truths. One truth is that um, it's, it's okay to change your mind. Another truth is, no, stick to the plan, right? Those are two truths. They're two agree, like you could agree that both have a place. Right. So the question is, are we not building 500 gyms because we now have the intelligence to realize that may not be the most advantageous thing? Or are we not building 500 gyms because we're impatient and we want things to be better, faster, easier, faster, right? So, and we just have to decide and, and it could be this one, right? And you, you may just be, look, I've done it. I thought I was going to open up 50 gyms of the franchise I've invested in, right? Now I've got a few and a part of me still thinks that there's a chance, right? But that's this part might be getting a little impatient. But I think there's another part of me that's starting to really assess things. And I go, you know what? Maybe I'll just have like 10. Uh, there's actually, uh, in Stoke philosophy, it shows that there's actually, uh, there's actually, uh, in Stoke philosophy, it shows that there's actually uh, not changing your mind when it makes sense is a sign of lack of intelligence, right? Because you're just so stubborn. And it's like, even though it makes all the sense to stop, you have to keep going according to the plans. You said you were going to do it. And it's like, sometimes the best decision is to fold. See, Mike, this is why I told you you got to do reels. You got to do these. This is cold. I'm doing it right here. Choose this. No, but this is cool. <laughs> This is the stuff that I don't think people understand. Like, I love the conventions and everything you guys put out. I love the power calls. But, and I think this is what you want me to talk at the next GSD on stage is about proximity and my relationships. But some of the greatest ships and pivots and seeds that have been planted on my head have been one or And I think we talked about it last time we had dinner was those moments where you just have that one word, one sentence, what something that somebody tells you and it just like, it just triggers you. And I've had multiple of those with you. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for giving us the opportunity to invite us to your house and be on Tales of the Underdog and everything. And before I let you go, I just was wondering, what is, where do you see yourself in the next three to five years as an individual and as a company? As an individual, um, extremely fit. That's a big focus for me lately. Um, I'm really working hard on that. Man, ripped? No, no, just, just, just ripped? No. Oh, okay. no. For Moses, he, he's, he's incredible. I got put on a ridiculous amount of muscle. Uh, and, and from what I understand, he's like mostly natural, which is in, in just great genetics. No, I'd be more uh, fit, just like I, I, I could still, like, my youngest is seven years old. Right. So I want to be able to still go out and do things and, and, uh, but not when I'm, it's not about five to five years. It's really about when I'm 90 years old, a hundred years old. Like I still want to be able to do things. So I'm working on it now. So, uh, it. as far as business goes, that's, that's been tough because I, I, I do, I think I spend a lot of time assessing. I know that I want louder to evolve to something a lot bigger than what it is. I'm really like our, our motto or slogan is where the best gyms go to grow. I'm working really, really hard right now to build things, not just for gyms that are like, you know, that kind of start now. In fact, we don't really have to start now. It's, it's, it's minimum 15,000 a month of a career. You have to have more work with, so we just kind of start now, but it's for the people that they don't know where to go next. They're already doing over 80, 90, hundred K a month. And it's like, you don't need to sign up for the coaching program that talks about struggling gyms, right? Like if you're struggling, what do you do if you're not struggling? We just stop drawing. So that's stupid. <laughs> we work so hard to get here. We have to stop. Yeah. The, so uh, we're working really, really hard on building out an incredible program. You're a part of that one. We're doing a really cool thing in August, a retreat for the A-class group, which is that we can do it over 83K a month. And uh, we're bringing in some really good speakers here on virtual levels. And I'm wanting to find a way to like break things up for them. Uh, but it's, I've got to, I've got to really figure out like, and that's why I'm interviewing a lot with them. And that's why it's important if you jump on those calls because I get to learn from you guys, but what is it that you need? And the more that I know what you guys need, that you, I'll build it. So right now, my vision, I don't know exactly what it looks like yet as far as the details, but I know what it looks like as far as probably have a few hundred gyms that are doing over seven figures that are not just do them all their gyms, but they'll probably be coming dozens of other businesses outside of their gym that are making money without them. They're probably selling their gyms, maybe even together as a portfolio to a PE firm or something else, or um, even just making more passive income on their own. Uh, 
That to me is more exciting is how do I help the people that there's nothing available to help them once they get to a certain level. No one's touching that argument. Everyone's helping the struggling league give her. Right, right. I love it, Mike. Well, Mike, I appreciate you for being on Joe's of the Underdog. And where can people find you in case they need information in regards to your company? If you go to YouTube and type in Loudly Merck, you'll find a lot of videos about me and then you can search me on Instagram, Mike RC Lodge. And I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Stingley. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody.